Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to The Hammer Factor here. I want to apologize about a couple things. Um, we recorded this almost two weeks ago, uh, but I've not had a chance to edit it and get it up. As well, my microphone was busted, so I had to use a pair of earbuds, uh, which doesn't help audio quality, and we had a marginal connection with Eric Giddens. Um, but I think we got it together in a listenable format here. Um, enjoy, and we will see you on the river. Grace, Geltman, and Weld on the Hammer Factor. Take it away, boys. Well, <clears throat> I don't blame you, dude. Climate refugee is a real thing. Like, yeah, dude. Like, there's going to be a bunch of people move to, like, from West Virginia down to here. I mean, we just had, like, five inches of rain. Everything's running. It's 80 degrees. I'm going to the Nolichucky tomorrow at, like, 5,000 CFS. It's going to be Surf City. T-shirt. Damn, my it, sister told me that they were like just, just. I went over there for dinner the other night, and they were they were discussing moving to Fayetteville. <laughs> yeah, I mean, <laughs> why sit out there in all that smoke, dude? Like, how unhealthy is that? <clears throat> like, my in laws, dude, they send me pictures of the smoke rolling in. They'll be like, "Oh, we got about an hour until it gets here." I mean, is that happening in Hood River? Uh, I mean, it's just kind of there it is, and I guess I don't know what's it like now. Now there, well. Uh, let's see. Um, I cannot see Mount Adams. Cool. So, like, what's the AQI? Like, 150? Not Mount Adams. No Mount Adams. <laughs> Would you go mountain biking right now or no? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It could be clouds, too. There's some clouds over there. <clears throat> it, it's, it's pretty clear. It, it, it's fine. Are you guys ready to get are guys, started? Are you going to come up, Well, No. Are you just on vacation, Lewis? Are you like on a kayaking trip, mountain biking trip? What are you doing? Um, I kind of wanted to just like post up up here for a month and like just kind of do the normal like work and shred, just get on the working man's double shred, but take some days off for sure and maybe take a week off in here at some point. He's working on moving. Grace, if I could just step in here. Are you like looking for property? Is that what's happening? Sure he is. I can't, dude, I can't afford that, man. Dude, it's fucking nuts up here. It's honestly, it's changed so much since probably the last time you were here, Grace. That it's like, well, not that he's not going to move there. He's going to move around there. I'm going to move to like Terrace. Yeah, I think that's the spot. There's no forest fires up there. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm just saying. <clears throat> Untrue. I don't know how you guys do it, man. Like, it didn't used to be like that, man. It's like, I mean. You know, we had that Eagle Creek fire like four years ago, and that was the first big one in like my time out there, you know, close to us. And then last year we had this like couple weeks when it was just like, you know, 500 AQI. We like couldn't leave the house for like a week. Like, are we, you know, we're, at some point we we're like, are we just being cupcakes about this? And we walked like three blocks to go pick up the CSA box. And it was so smoky that like, you know, like your throat's burning, like just like walking down the street. And you're like, this is Fox, you know? <laughs> AQI air quality index is that what that is? Yeah, that's it. That's the new weather that we jack in uh, in the West now. <laughs> that's so sad, dude. Are we starting the show? <laughs> the show's going. I'm recording. Welcome to Hammer Factor 84. Uh, my name is John Grace. I'm your producer here at the Hammer Factor, and I would like to introduce my co-host John Weld, Whitewater legend and co-owner of Immersion Research, and Lewis Geltman, policy director at the Outdoor Alliance, former North Fork champion. Guys, I just recorded some of that. I don't know if I'll put it in the show, but what's going on? I don't know. There's no doubling back. Yeah, no double. I'll just go ahead and put it in there. I was just out <laughs> east. You know, I flew out east to check in with things out there. Aiden and I, Kara's out there. So we paddled, Aiden and I paddled the upper yacht probably like five times. And then we paddled the upper Blackwater, Aiden's first time down. 
at like 400 CFS, which is like the best first time level, right? You get down there and you can smell, you know, the smell of like fresh rain on a summer, oh, on a summertime. Ah, river. Yes, I do. It's it's right now. Listen, let me open you know it. What I mean, I love this you smell when you're walking down, just like walking down to the put in at the upper B and the earth is just like so rich and like all the rhododendrons. Like yeah. I know. Yeah. Oh man. That's a beautiful place. So yeah, I took, I took the puffy steez down there more about that later, but what a boat, man. Right. I've never paddled it, dude. So what makes it fabulous? I also paddled the uh, that that chili that new um, Zet boat too. How's that? Um, You know, it's about this. I mean, it's too small for me. I'd say if you're 150 pounds, you're in the pocket for that boat or less. Maybe like 130 to 150. So it's like the same. It looks like the same because I paddled that and the small Ripper back back to back on the lower yacht one day. And they were pretty similar in size. You know, obviously, volt gallons doesn't really mean everything, but uh, it, you know, it's a slalom boat. I mean, people talk about boat plastic boats behaving like a slalom boat. That one does, you know, almost to a fault. Um, it would not be your big slappy treat layer, you know, like a like a steez whiz. You know what I mean? It's super quick. Su- it's super fast. Super nimble. It feels just like a slalom boat. And Kara sat in it, and she's like, "I'd paddle this ten times." Uh, you know, oh, 10 times over a ripper just because of the slalom feel to it. But I can tell you a lot of, certainly a lot of American paddlers aren't going to take to that because that is one of the big slappy, you know, big, booth treats. Big <laughs> slappy treat layer. Yeah. <laughs> you know, which you is both, the steep. You, know? you need right. both. Now that you need like the like properly slicey half slice and then you need the steez. But if you wanted like a boat to paddle down a river like a slalom boat, that's it. I'll tell you a couple things about that boat, though. I don't know anything about the British market, the European market, but the outfitting in that boat was unacceptably bad. And maybe in Europe they have a reason for that that I don't know, but it was ridiculous, uh, just unacceptably bad. Uh, it was like a foam seat, it was just like sitting on the bottom of the boat almost. The back band was on these two cams. It didn't work at all. Like no one had even tried the back band because they didn't hold. You had to tie huge knots and to get it to stay. Um, it was just silly. And the thigh braces were really cheap. Um, and the cockpit. I, at some point, boat manufacturers have to pull their head out of the ass by making bad cockpit rims. And, and some people are going to paddle this boat and they're going to be like, it's per- the cockpit's perfectly fine. There's no rim that leaks 100% for everybody. It's kind of a subjective thing. But you're going to get more complaints from that boat from the leaking rim than most any other boat just because of the po- cockpit design. It just it, There's no reason for it, too. That's, that's really frustrating for me. Um, other than that, it was a good, good boat. <laughs> I mean, it was an interesting boat because it was, it was, the hull was great, I think, for, from a slalom standpoint. Was it just less rocker, like more narrow? Yeah. What do you? Yeah, very narrow. Yeah, I definitely like the feel of wider boats, especially in any kind of white water. Yeah, it's, this like, would not be like your class five half slice boat for sure. I used to be just like all all I wanted was a narrow boat, and it like frustrated me to no end how wide plastic boats are. And then you know, after paddling walker boats for some years now, I've sort of gotten addicted to that like on top of the water feeling that you get from a really wide boat and yeah the big slappy treat boat <laughs> the big fat <laughs> slappy treats <laughs> yeah i guess so i don't know it's sweet i mean you're just like skipping off everything yeah it's great yeah that's what you want man once you just get that little bit of speed and that little bit of downhill and you just link 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 that's yeah the, i'm over like fun. being in the water i want to be on the water now <laughs> yeah no, I'm with you there. You know, in regards to Zet, they may have, like I said, I don't know, I don't know anything about Zet as a company. And maybe in Europe they have a, a lot of clubs and they want a cheaper outfitting trim level. I don't know. But um, I think I think in American market we're going to de- demand a lot more out of the outfitting. That's for sure. <clears throat> There's some good outfitting out there right now. Like I've jumped around in a few different companies' boats, and it's like you can pretty much jump right in and make it work. At least I can. I feel like every every company has like something that they're doing right, and every company has something that they're doing like infuriatingly stupidly. I think you're probably right with that. 
I don't know. So I got quite a few compliments on the last show. Did you guys get any? anybody talk to you about that? I definitely had some people write some texts about it for sure. That was cool. A lot of history there, huh? Yeah. Um, I Did you guys see? You know, we have another we have another movie coming up on the show. Are we allowed to talk about that? Yeah, and I ha- I'm in the process. I think I've got a date scheduled for those guys in two weeks. So. Did you guys watch this movie? I haven't yet. I'm really excited to though. Dude, I have not watched it yet either. Freaking amazing! So tell Great. me about it. Great stuff. It's about it's about the the Canoe Andes team, the Polish rafting team in the late seventies, early eighties, sort of escaped Poland to paddle in in South America and Central America and North America and Mexico. But it's an amazing story. I mean, I don't know, I don't want to give away too much, but um, and the guy who put it together did, did a great job. It, it was it was cool for me also because you know I my first year in Mexico was nineteen eighty nine, right? And we were in Halcomulco doing a training camp. And that was, you know, on the Pescados, which is one of the rivers these Polish guys ran first. You know what I mean? This is sort of the beginning of our winters in Mexico for like the next seven, nah, six years or so. I was in Mexico like every winter. And for the entire time, we couldn't go anywhere and do a river without saying, oh, yeah, the Polish guys were here first. <laughs> it was, I mean, it, and hard to believe that, you know, you look at the video and it seems like it was 150 years ago. But that was just a few years before we were there. Right. So it was very cool to, to, to see the whole story. Dude, I just think it's cool that these whitewater films are being made. You know, I mean, it seems like everything's a one minute Insta cut or, you know, some Facebook story or something. And I mean, there's two like amazing films that just came out on whitewater. So, yeah. Yeah. And this is a historical document, too. And it's it really is about adventure in every sense of the word, which I loved. I don't know. <clears throat> well, we got a hell of a show lined up. We got Eric Giddens giving us a report from the Olympics, from Tokyo. Fill us in on how all that went. But uh, he was the announcer for the slalom, and one of the announcers for the slalom events at the uh, uh, Olympics. So it'll be really cool to get his take. I think he's an, an, I think the term is analyst. Analyst. Right. Did you, did you guys see Giddo on the broadcast or hear him on the broadcast or did you just watch? So awesome. Really? I, I didn't get any of it. All I got was the like live stream, which was like the absolute like dregs of like the, I don't know. Was I, I mean, get it. The Olympic coverage was awful. I'm not going to, let's not, that, that's what I'm saying. I'm saying Ghetto's <laughs> delivery. I don't know where Ghetto got this radio voice from, but it is magical. <laughs> I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, I, yeah, I like, I, we, we watched all the live streams and, uh, <sighs> It's like I, I kind of think that what they were doing was like like sh- filming and then like packaging up the like coverage and giving it to like you know different TV stations to like provide their own real real announcers and then what you got if you were watching on the live stream was like I don't know just like the like third tier of replacement level like generic announcers and like for slalom you know the live stream like what you're getting is guys who like it sounds like they're watching slalom for like the second or third time ever. <laughs> and it's just like so painful. And man, I wish we could have gotten Ghetto. And I heard John Hastings was doing the Canadian coverage. We were all just like, how do we get to watch like John Case, John Hastings do it? It's like, I mean, there's so many good people, but I think they were all doing it for like the actual TV coverage. And this I don't know how you even got to see any of this. Yeah, I mean, I got a little glimpse of it here and there, but Kara sat around here for a couple hours one day trying to get it, and she got me involved for a half hour. I threw my hands up, and for like the next five days, she's screaming at the computer and screaming at the TV and. You know, looking at NBC or the Olympic Channel or the Olympic app or Peacock or oh, dude, we NBC watched all sports, that. NBC Sports Gold. She's trying all this crap to find it. She can't find it anywhere. It was one. I mean, you know? we watched all of it live. I was me and uh, me and Wait, I, How did you it, find it, it? Like I went through. It was, like, it, was every... like NBC, it was like NBCOlympics.com. You needed somebody's cable TV, like somebody who was a t- cable TV subscriber. Yeah, like I don't know yeah. anybody who who's on the. And then you could watch everything live. Who the hell's a cable? Who's TV on subscriber? the cord? Who do you find? How do you find that person? Yeah, it's like, like your parents or somebody. <sighs> yeah, but they're Dude, not my your parents kids. have That's kicked not, that. And they the have like regional cable for like Mid Atlantic. 
that's that's all you need. The hard part is finding somebody who still has cable TV, who is also youthful enough to be able to identify how to log into their online cable TV account. But I mean, dude, we watched. So I watched like the men's kayak with uh, uh, Isaac Levinson's with Isaac and Claudia. And then we got Scotty Parsons and uh, his girlfriend Liat on Skype so that we could like just talk shit the whole way through. And just like got the live streams all queued up, so we were on See, the. I on wish the I could have figured that out. It like it was great, man. We had a great time. <laughs> oh, man. good on you, I dude. It was so. The coverage was just. If you were watching any of the prime time coverage, the way they were cutting in the commercials, like right in the middle of the action, whatever, was so frustrating. It was so frustrating. Like we were talking, it was such a struggle to figure out how to watch it. You know. Yeah, you gotta get on the live streams, dude. I watched like all of the uh, the track cycling live streams. Well, if you got into track cycling at all, or uh, no, <laughs> dude, that's like it's so fun to watch. <laughs> that's such an extension of your flat water career. I didn't ever begin with it. <laughs> Just more dudes in lycra suits. This is Trent springing up here. Right? Uh, <laughs> all right. Track cycling. Watch the mountain bike race, like pretty much the entire race. Like I don't know. We're okay, kinda... we get, it, we get it, we get it. That was sounds yeah, great. Thank you got you. to see it's everything. That's totally beat her. Just pretty much. <laughs> what it comes down. Oh, so <clears throat> anyway, we got Eric coming on to talk all things Olympics. Give us some behind the scenes. Um, ha, huh. Lewis, you got anything on the policy front? Did you find? Uh, did you find a sidekick? Hmm. Um, not yet. I have not even really looked that closely at the applicant pool yet. We're taking applicants to like, I don't know, I want to say like September 5th or something like that. Um, got a couple of emails from Hammer Factor listeners, which is good. Oh no. What did they say? <laughs> I mean, like people who were like, yeah, I heard you guys are hiring on the Hammer Factor. I'm interested in applying. Like, can you give me a little beta? Yeah. <laughs> Dude, you better hire one of those guys. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, it's certainly not all out of the realm of the possible, but hopefully we got a lot of a lot of good folks. So, oh, God, um, Gu- guarantee they're the most qual- qualified. What's that? <clears throat> Put me down as a reference for one of those guys. Yeah, all right, I will. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a demand, right? It's like if you're spending your time listening to this, you're <laughs> you're owed something. I, I, know, I know more about you than you want me to. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know on the policy front. I mean, there's a lot going on. I mean, we're, um, you know, obviously the, the Senate just passed that, uh, like bipartisan infrastructure bill and simultaneously, you know, the Democrats on both sides are trying to pass like a big, um, second package through reconciliation, which is going to be the home to much more of the climate focused stuff because Republicans are not particularly interested in addressing climate change. So, um, I mean, I think for us, that's where a lot of the the stuff we're most interested in is going to be. And we're definitely very keen for folks to reach out to their members of Congress and encourage them to go big on climate. I mean, it feels like there's going to be, you know, like Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin get a lot of the attention as far as being sort of the, most conservative Democrats who are raising concerns about, you know, going big on a lot of things, but, you know, this potential like three and a half trillion dollar second package, I think there's going to be a fair number of more conservative Democrats who are going to have misgivings, whether that's because of the deficit or inflation or God knows what, but I think it's important for those folks to hear it from their constituents that, you know, it's urgent to go big on climate right now. And I think this package is going to be, I mean, I don't want to say like our last best hope, but kind of our last best hope for doing something big on climate change. I mean, the last real window of opportunity that we had as a country to like really get something done was like the first two years of the Obama administration and that didn't pan out. And here we are, you know, 12 years later and, uh, you know, it's 12 years of lost time. So it's really important that we, you know, take this window of opportunity to, to get something done. So I think it's going to be a big push for us from us over the next, you know, couple of months. So, I mean, think about like, you got like the Colorado is as low as it's ever been. 
the whole West is on fire. It rains here all the time. Anybody who's like an adult has watched how quickly the climate is changing. I mean, it's insane, right? I mean, it's like these are things that are meant to play out over like geological time. And even like 20 years ago, we're talking about climate change. That was sort of the message, right? It was like, we're going to like, these are the changes that we're going to see over the course of 100 years or 150 years. And that they're meant to occur over thousands and thousands of years. And in fact, we're seeing these changes in the course of like five years or 10 years or like, yeah, and it's, it's terrifying, you know, it is terrifying. I mean, just like the composition of the atmosphere is changing faster than it ever has, you know, like there's less oxygen, more carbon dioxide, just like, I don't know how this is like a, a big thing I think about, especially, I don't know, having kids, it's like a, a like a thing that occupies me more than most things. I don't get concerned about a lot of <clears throat> politics, but I'm like, holy smokes, man. This is like a thing. Yeah. I mean, it's like other things. It's like you get another chance, you know? It's like there's always, I mean, you know, people suffer along the way for a lot of different reasons, but, you know, as far as just sort of humanity goes, I mean, this is, it's, you know, these are things that are kind of irreversible. So you got to kind of get it right. We'll head over to outdooralliance.org. Put in your application. Um, Lewis, when's the applications close? When are you done looking for people? I want to say like September 5th, but I'm not 100% on that. All right. Those guys do good work over there. Um, so should we – let's just get into Eric. Yeah. Okay. Um, we've had Eric on the show before while I'm switching over here into producer mode. Can one of you guys try and fill us in on who Eric is? Well, he's married to Rebecca Giddens, <laughs> Rebecca Bennett, <laughs> who was a slalom racer and silver medalist in the Olympics. World champion. World champion. Eric was not a terrible slalom racer himself. I think he uh, <laughs> not a half bad kayaker. If he was listening to this, he would. He'd agree. He would, yeah. <laughs> Rebecca's kind of the star of the family. He's just he's kind of doing support. All right, let's they have a brewery. I think they run a brewery in uh in California somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> You're supposed to be picking up the slack here, fellas. <laughs> okay, I'm calling Mr. Giddens. Did I, did I press the right button? Oh, there he is. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Welcome to the show, Eric Giddens. What's up, gentlemen? Eric, I, they were asking me to describe you, and I was like, well, he's married to Rebecca Bennett. That works. That's kind of your defining, your defining feature. Uh, yeah, are we going to go over all of our defining features, Mr. Weld? <laughs> <laughs> Look, in this town, it's clear I'm, I'm Mr. Carroll. Yeah. There's no question. What's up, Lewis? Nothing, man. What's going on with you? It's good to see you. No, just living the dream out here in the Nerve Center at Kern River Brewing Company. Nice, man. How's the smoke? How's the uh, air to the uh, AQI? It's not horrible here. This is one of the few parts of California not on fire, but it's still smoky and hot. And can't wait for the first big rain or any rain of any kind. Would be nice, dude. We just had I saw, like, yeah. I saw the first rain two nights ago that I'd seen in like months, and it was just like, oh man, it was awesome. Just like walking around the rain. Just there's Rebecca. Just got. <laughs> I got video bombed. Can you hop out of that seat and put her in here for a little bit? <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're in here. I do not like the spotlight. I just want to see your faces. Hi. Hey, Rebecca. Up, Rebecca? Oh, there we are. are we live? We're live. Mm -hmm. As live as we can get here at the Hammer Factor. <laughs> awesome. Lewis, too. Hi, Lewis. How's it going? I'm walking down. Oh, my goodness. I had the door shut and locked, but she just... Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Take those locks. Can't trust them. Rebecca, how was – real quick before you run off, how did uh, – what did you think of his um, announcing at the games? Commentary. I was to say it in front of him because <laughs> I get 
mistake. She wasn't even listening. She was on a raft trip somewhere. I did go on a raft trip for a little bit, and also went backpacking for a little bit. But I caught a bunch, and it was awesome. No, really. Like, he made sprint super exciting. <laughs> huh. Sweet. You did. Sp- I didn't know you did sprint also. Oh, you don't know this about me? Uh-uh. Interesting. Yeah, multi did. <clears throat> yeah, you and, you and Geltman, both. Interesting. <laughs> uh. Huh. Well, let's get into it, Eric. Tell me about your experience or experience with everything. So uh, this was the third broadcasting uh, for the Olympics. This was the first time I was entirely not on site. So I was in Connecticut at the NBC Sports compound. So, so it was wait, a lot of... Wait, let me ask you a question. So when do they ask you to do this? Like when do they approach you for, for 2020 Olympics? So usually what happens is they call me like nine months before like that's i haven't heard from them since the last olympics and they called me up like hey you want to do it again here's the number uh, here's the, the dollar amount here's when you'd be there yeah and i so yeah and so the dollar amount we're talking like four figures five figures it's huge huge yeah yeah, huge uh so, no I, I i don't do it for the money i do it for the love of the sport <laughs> Yeah, and I so mean, in this case, yeah, go ahead. It's, I haven't broken it down to an hourly wage, but I, I'm basically there. I, I live 21 days of my life to basically research and broadcast, and and yeah, so it's 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 probably not worth it monetarily, but it's you know something I care about. So, so they fly you to Connecticut. Yeah, yeah, not even first class this time. Yeah, no, it was, uh, coach, it was very back of the plane. Yeah, really, yeah, in the past, we've gotten like a business class ticket, but yeah. Wow. What, Southwest or what airline are you on? Uh, I'm actually on, on the wing. I'm just sitting on. <laughs> yeah. All right, well, all right. Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I just want to get some details set aside here. Before you we... Interrupt me anytime, Mr. Weld. That's your forte. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, I was, uh, what was I saying? Um, yeah, it's my third time doing it. So a lot of the, the nuances and surprises are gone. In fact, like on our broadcast team, uh, most of the people were, it was their first Olympics. So I was the old guy, again, the old guy in the room. And um, yeah, it's, you know, it's it's a lot of work because slalom, obviously I'm not competing anymore. So I have to kind of get caught back up to date on that. And then sprint is just a whole nother game. It's not my sport even, but they want to double up. They want the same person calling whitewater kayaking as flatwater kayaking. And in their eyes, it's kind of the same thing. So um, I do double duty. So it's six days of whitewater uh, it was a two-day break, and then six days of sprint. There's a few days on the front end, and pretty much as soon as I'm done, I'm back on that airplane wing flying home. And nice. then, are you are you now like when you're doing your work? Is it real time with the event, or are you doing it after the event happened? And are you able to yeah. like cut stuff out and re-record it? And so, all of the calls I've ever done have been live, yeah. to, to either live to um, to broadcast or live to tape. And then they'll splice that up and, and throw it on later. It's kind of hard to uh, to broadcast something you know the outcome for already. So mm. um, we always call it live. Every now and then there's a mistake that they'll they'll kind of scrub out and, and go back in. Uh, it didn't happen this time. It's happened in previous years. But they like to kind of go with what you know what you're thinking on the spot. So and this year that's like two or three in the morning in Connecticut. So uh, I get off work at four in the morning go back to the hotel and, and, you know, watch late night NBC and then sleep all day and then go back to the compound at like 10 o'clock at night. So it was, yeah, it was odd. It's not what you'd think of when you're watching the Olympics, but it, I think it comes across like, like we're almost there. So you're sitting in a studio, you're mic'd up with headphones and you're watching a program feed and you've got a show producer there. who's just like, all right, have at it. Yeah, so even this year with COVID protocol, normally I'm in the same, we're all in a box, right? It's basically like a C train, but like one third the size. Um, and they have these all around for all the different sports. Uh, our little C train was divided into three parts. Me, um, we had like a divider between me and the play-by-play guy. I'm the I'm the analyst or the color guy. I can't use color anymore because that's issues. Um, and then the producer's in a whole other room. So we're basically talking to each other on headsets and watching a a little monitor and that's that's kind of the gist uh, in previous years for sprint at least i've been on site at the finish line and that makes it easier because you feel the energy of the crowd and, and all that sort of thing but but not the case this year in tokyo do you have to do research on all these people who are racing 
Like, how do you find out information on them? Like, do you have to like little fun facts or tidbits or what do you? So, uh, I've got, we've got an actual research guy that's part of my team. Um, it's actually Gerald Babau. I don't know if you remember him, Lewis. He worked at USAC for a while. Um, yeah, so he, you know, at the beginning of the, of the, the two weeks or whatever, he prints out all this information. So I had like 250 sprint athletes that I had packets oh. on to, to learn in 80 uh, something uh, whitewater. You kind of know who's going to be the topics of conversation. Mm. Um, but yeah, you kind of have to be prepared for whoever does. You, know, you don't know who you're going to call. So we'd be sitting there and it's like, okay, we're going live to this next race. And it's, you know, some guy from the Cook Islands who's swimming out of the start line at the sprint race, which happened. And you got to be prepared to say something. And it's like, all right, we're live. And, you know, here's a guy who fell out of the boat at the start line. <laughs> what he, he, say? he got, he got <laughs> four strokes in his Olympic career um, and then fell in the water. Uh, that sounds and like a lot of my races. <laughs> yeah, Olympian, which is more than we could say for you, Mr. Weld. <laughs> But what do you, I mean, how do you spit that? Like, how do you not make that like a, just a joke or, uh, or just start laughing or. <laughs> well, so this is what I, 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 you know, I, you don't know. So you have to kind of process this real time and you, you don't want to come across as a jerk, but you have to say something, right? Cause the guy fell out of the boat, sure. but, you know, he made it to the start line and once you're an Olympian, always an Olympian, never former, never passed. And then. All right, yeah, the guy, the guy kind of messed up, um, and uh, yeah, you you roll with it, and and that's just kind of how it goes. And then there was another sprint boat; they fell out like ten feet from the finish line, mm. so you got to you got to acknowledge that sort of stuff. And that's a little more exciting than falling out of your boat at the start line. But <laughs> were there any whitewater oh, swimmers? Man. No, no, there were none whatsoever. There was there was one snit. Um, that we called for a, 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 a British woman. But other than that, it was pretty, you know, pretty solid. Pretty solid. What do you mean a snit that we called for a British woman? Oh, well, so basically quitting. Uh, there was no throwing of paddles, or I've seen Lewis before, like, choke up on his paddle. and <laughs> uh, That didn't happen. She just stopped and, and cried, which I've done, so I can't really blame her. I, I'm more intrigued to go back and watch this now than I ever have been. <laughs> so. Nobody wants that to happen. And you don't want to ridicule something because it's not hard. I mean, have you guys ever been in a sprint boat? Anybody? Yeah. Lewis? Never. Yeah. No. They're very tippy. I've never been. In yeah, yeah. I, so I'm not saying play. I wouldn't swim. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to sort of, I kind of went back and like, look, it's not as easy as it looks. This isn't a summer camp, you know, kayak. You know, you have to have tremendous balance and skill, you know, like maybe wild water paddling would, would be the closest, you know, need to get get that done. But, yeah, I, you know, you, you try so not to truth, make it. The, the truth is, is, like, I'd watch a gymnast fall off a balance beam. I'd be like, of course you fell off the balance beam. Who wouldn't? But <laughs> as a gymnast, they're like, they're still laughing at her. But most people wouldn't pick up the nuances of someone flipping over in a kayak at the start line. They'd be like, yeah, that happens. Yeah. Yeah, and I've swam out of a wild water boat. So. Yes, you did, didn't you? Ah, you like that. I was there for that. That was wonderful. <laughs> God, was man, I got to say, I like, I tried to watch the sprint this year. Like, just, I don't mm. know. Weld's been giving me a hard time because I've been paddling a bunch of surf ski. And I was like, all right, I'm going to learn how to use a wing properly. I'm going to watch these guys. Yeah. And like, man, it was, it was so boring. <laughs> like, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I'm, glad you I'm glad you liked my commentary. <laughs> well, um, I don't do, we were also, before you came on, we were whinging about our difficulties in watching the commentary. And so uh, I watched the live stream uh, of everything, which is not you. It feels like there's like the like replacement level guys get thrown on the live stream. And like for slalom, we got guys who, you know, like it seemed like it was their second or third time watching a slalom race ever. Yeah, I didn't hear any of that. So that's the Olympic broadcast system. So that's separate from NBC. Yeah. That's like world feed. Um, that's what I, I got. <laughs> but man, if I know. Upgrade to the real thing, Lewis, and you'll. I can make I can make flat water really exciting. But, I, I mean, it would have improved my my viewing experience by miles, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> so how was how was the Olympic course? Was it a I mean, in general, was it a good course or? So going back to the slalom side of things, I assume yeah. you're asking 
because the lake's kind of freaking lake, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> it, it was. Uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was tricky the whole way down, um, and you know the moves that tended to have issues were not like necessarily the marquee moves. So it shows you how how difficult it was to concentrate the whole way down the course. I thought it was was fascinating. Um, and then you look at like the men's kayak race. Uh, there was a lot of shaky paddling. That shows you how difficult the course was. Um, you know, you, you normally expect like the men's kayaks to be really close. They weren't. They were pretty spread out. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, you look at you look at it, and you're so used to seeing the people running whitewater and YouTube videos, and you have no perspective on. It. And you look at the Olympic course, you're like, that's class two. Who couldn't negotiate that? But if you ever sat in a slalom boat, a slalom course, you know how how difficult it can it can really be. You know. Yeah, I mean, and you think of the people that are watching the Olympics. What do we have? Like maybe a hundred kayakers that watch the Olympics uh, of kayaking, and you have you know thousands of people watching it. I, they all thought it was really impressive. Like the producer that I worked with, it was her first time seeing the sport. She thought it was great. She's like, "Why don't we have this on TV more often? It looks great." Um, so you know, I think you know, you as a class five boater kind of poo pooed the water, but for, for someone that doesn't know any better, it's it's a fantastic looking sport. I think. What were the stats on the course? Like how much volume was in it? How much did it drop? So it's uh, 450 CFS uh, was the flow, and it dropped 14 feet. So 250 meters dropped 14 feet. Okay. I had to know these things. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. Hmm. <clears throat> Dude, it must have been hard to, like, not have, a like, a co-announcer to play off of. I mean, well, we had the play-by-play person, so that that's the, you know, like the guy that I was working with, he called fencing and maybe some shooting or archery or something. So he was working a few different sports, um, but he went in and he would be, you know, he would introduce the paddlers and then at the finish line, he would say stuff. And I was kind of, I, I would analyze the run as it happened. So um, if you, uh, I was the John Madden and, you know, he, he was the, uh, the, uh, the other guy. <laughs> but some roll. <laughs> but uh but you guys weren't in the room together. We were in a box separated oh. by a by a by a curtain. Okay. Um, normally we would be in the room together and like we could like you know, if he was done talking, he could like shake my shoulder. Yeah. This time we had to just kind of go off on, you know, just rhythm and, and just you know when the other person stopped talking. I don't it's it's if if you've never done it before, it's it's kinda like dancing and you kind of eventually pick up the 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 nonverbal cues is when to start and when to stop. And it takes a little time, but unfortunately it's always a different person. Every Olympics that you can't build that repertoire. Like you guys had here on hammer factor. I mean, mm -hmm. wow. you're like, we just, we just all just wait for well to interrupt us. <laughs> yeah. What, uh, all right, let's talk about the, the competitors who is, I mean, we're the countries that just have the best slalom teams on earth right now. Well, um, I and mean, how do Americans, stand up against this and what's the future so let's start with the americans i thought they did really well um you know we, we made basically all the finals uh i think except for maybe k1 women's finals but but the athletes did well i think bug Lockin had a really good shot at a medal like he just you know made some mistakes and same thing with Mihal Smolten. so they both they both were legit contenders for a medal which is great that's all you can ask for every year um, and then, you know, we got a 17 year old, uh, woman who's just fantastic and she's gonna, she's gonna get better and better. Um, and, uh, I think it'll, I think, I think the future is bright. It's just not real deep. We don't have the number of athletes that Germany has or the Czech Republic or, or France. So we have to rely on just a few paddlers, but that's, that's how it's always been. You know, things haven't really changed. I mean, I think the participation of Solomon has dropped in the past 30 years. Oh, it's tanked. Yeah. I guess yeah, my I mean, impression is that it's been sort of on the upswing in the last like five or 10, at least. I mean, I guess, you know, speaking the folks in DC, I think DC has a huge contingent of kids right now from my understanding. And like, some of them are like quite legit. Well, I think some of the so, paddlers you know, are happy you know. kid and they're, and they're good, but you look at team trials this year, there are what, 20, 21 men's kayaks in team trials, Oof. three women, C ones, like seven women's kayaks. Like that's not good. So we got to fix that if we want to if we want to improve. But dude, how do we fix that? How do we make these names known? I mean, I couldn't even figure out how to watch the Olympics. So it's it's got to be something outside of the Olympics. Yeah, I, I don't think the Olympics has much to do with it. It's I mean, it's it's what they do in Europe better than anyone else is they have the clubs, and then you know, kids after school they go to the club and they get in their boat and they 
dink around on the water. And if they have talent, the coach grabs them and says, Hey, you have talent. Let's put you on the junior team. And, and that's just what they do. Um, you know, here we get out of school, we go home and we play video games and maybe we play basketball or football, but that's, you know, kayaking isn't on the radar unless your parents did it. And that's what's happening now. We have, you know, people whose families have been involved in the sport and that's the only way we're able to retain any kind of talent. So start, start making babies and get them out there. Yeah. I, Geltman. I did my part. Well, you got some paddlers. Yeah. Yeah. Geltman. Yeah. yeah you got them out there. You just got to find them. <laughs> Thanks. Get out. <laughs> All right. And so what country, what countries are crushing it? Like who has the strongest? Germany is always great. Czech Republic's been been really solid. They got a couple of medals this year. Um, it's just all all the European countries. Um, so, yeah, France. Uh, I mean, you've got Jess Fox, who's just dominant individual. But other than that, it's just all it's all European uh, countries. Czech Republic, Slovakia, Germany, France. It, what were the standout moments for you? Was there any 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 dark horses that came through? Like. You know, if someone, one of our listeners here is into whitewater kayaking or whatever, like, and you could send them on a search for a name or to, or to get involved, like, what were some, what were some interesting stories? Uh, well, I think the biggest one for me, um, again, if you take the Americans out, I, I had a, a personal connection with, with Bug Lockin, obviously, and, and, lo- and enjoyed seeing him battle. But Jessica Fox, right? So she's the, the of five-time world champion, Richard Fox. Her mom was an Olympic bronze medalist um and i counted up she had like 70 olympic world championship and world cup medals coming into the olympics like 70 70 jessica fox yeah yeah but she hadn't won a gold medal yet in the olympics so that was the huge thing you know could she break through she was paddling both k1 and c1 and a gold medal for both she ended up third in k1 after having a touch that knocked her out of the gold medal and then her last chance for this for Tokyo was in C1, and it was a pretty pretty impressive showing. I don't know if you guys got to watch it, but uh, she's uh, she's a pretty amazing paddling. Awesome. Yeah, and I mean that run. So her Scotty pointed this out. Like I was telling these guys before you jumped on, we uh, me and Isaac watched with Scotty joining us via Skype, so we could talk shit the whole time. As, as Scotty yeah. pointed out. Um, <laughs> Jess Fox's run, I mean, it was like obviously this huge disappointment that she didn't win women's kayak. Her C1 run was fast enough to have won the women's kayak race. And um, I think it would have been six that would have put her just ahead of bug in the men's kayak race. She's the men's legit. C1 race. Yeah, like yeah. super, super, super legit, like redemptive run after that. Wait, wait, say okay. that again, Lewis. Her time her, would have... So, so she, you know, I mean, kayaks are always, I mean, Kayaks generally are faster than C1s. Like the winning time at a World Cup race, the fastest time of the weekend or whatever will always be men's kayak. And C1s are a bit behind that, you know, and it's in her just because the C1 is not as fast as the kayak. Right. And so her C1 run was fast enough that it would have won the women's kayak race. And it also was fast enough that it would have been sixth in the men's C1 category. Oh, wow. Crushing it. Like super, super legit run. Well, and, and you think about this was the first time C1 was in the Olympics for women. Um, and there were a lot of people that fought it tooth and nail. They said the women wouldn't be good enough. They, you know, they would suck and they wouldn't show up well on the sport. Not the case. Like she was, she was, I, I don't, I mean, I certainly couldn't have gone out in my kayak and beaten that time. Not right now. <laughs> so, yeah, it was, it was, it was great to see and, and, and great for her too. So, badass. All right. So, so what do you, it was cool. Did you, what do you think of the men's kayak race? Oh, Prishkovich was was amazing. Like, yeah, I, don't know. I never li- really liked his dad all that much, but it was it was <laughs> fun to, it was fun to watch him paddle. Just the, what he does around those gate poles, uh, like it's just it's insane. And um, and he and he he's he's paddling at such a high risk level the whole way down the course, and then when he nails it, it's just like no one can touch him. And that's what happened on the biggest stage. And when, you know, when, when you've trained your whole life trying to do something and, and never, you know, never been able to like dominate like that, you can appreciate it. It's like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that he just hung it out on the line like that and, and it pulled it off on the biggest yeah. stage there. It was, I mean, I felt, I guess to me, it felt like, you know, up to that point in the men's kayak final, it had been 
it felt like a little lackluster, like, you know, like when like Misha's run in the semifinal, like he was early to go and we were all like, uh, like that's probably going to, you know, be like ninth or 10th, like hopefully, like hopefully he gets through with that. And, you know, that time would have been good for the bronze in the final. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it seemed like, you know, nobody really put it together. And then Jacob Grigar had a pretty, pretty sick run. And then Yuri Praskovic came down and it was just like, you know, like I feel like when you watch the Olympics, what you want to see is like the gold medal winning run just be like fucking bananas, you know, and like Yuri did that, you know, and like to see that, like that's what you want to see, right? Like you want to see somebody just go nuts and like his run was sick. Yeah. And like, question. Yeah. You don't want someone to back into a gold medal that never feels good. Yeah. Unless you're somebody grab it. And to be the last boat down and across the line knowing you won, you know, that's, 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 that's certainly from a broadcasting point of view, that's what you want to see. And I think as an athlete too, you want to see that. Yeah. He's got to be, I mean, he's one of my favorite characters to watch like in any discipline. Like if you're a casual, if you're, like, if you're just becoming aware of slalom racing, like watch some Yuri Preskovich runs on YouTube or something. Like he's just fantastic yeah. to watch. You, you can just go to YouTube after, after the end of this awesome show, go to YouTube. <laughs> you might even be able to hear me talk about it. Cause I think there's some out there. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, again, it's like a, like a gymnast riding a racehorse on like a luge track. It's like, it was just, <laughs> I like that description. It's a lot like <laughs> big slappy treats or whatever. Well, came up with her. <laughs> guy. Big slap. did you guys ever like go on a run and broadcast it? Like, like you were working for NBC or something? Like, how do you mean? Yeah. Like, like the world could like plug in a, a YouTube video right now of the Olympic run. And you guys could break it down, call call the action. No, we don't have the voice. I, I, I don't feel, have the voice. I feel like the Olympics would come after us, man. Oh, yeah. I don't think so. You, you guys are big. I don't know if you're big enough. <laughs> <laughs> do they train you to do the announcer voice, or is that something you just brought to the table on your own? So here, here's the only uh, problem I have with working for NBC is I get zero feedback. Um, they either fire me or rehire me. So I guess that's. My, um, yeah, I, I, you know, every time I'm, I'm, look, I, like I said, I don't do this for the money. I want the sport to come across, you know, good on television. And I, I just, I, I wish there was more training. I wish there was more feedback because I, you know, I want to do my best. And, and oh, I get I very, think you're doing great. Oh, yeah. Thanks, John. I, I, sorry delighted. To I, I take so much delight in your announcer voice. <laughs> it's really well, good. I'm, I'm, I, I'm disappointed, you guys, because we play announcer bingo where I have to work words in to the broadcast. If you guys got me like three weeks ago, we could have snuck in some hammer factor verbiage in there. Oh, oh man. <laughs> could have been like, he's really, he's really laying treats on this, on this run. Exactly. <laughs> I could have told you that I, I did it for my group team. Uh, I snuck in Sasquatch. They said, I, we want you to say the word Sasquatch. And so I snuck it in on the French, on Boris Neveu's run, so. <laughs> so cool. Yeah. Man, oh Next man. Time. Do, you, do you do any broadcast work like in the intervening four years? It's just like you just come back. It's, all, it's all cold turkey. Yeah, it's rough. Radio and you know, announcing yeah, commercials, voiceovers. Uh, no, I mean, I I, I, I I do speak publicly a lot at the brewery, you know, being, you know, being a, a famous guy, John, I have to, have to you know, like, work on my public out. <laughs> <laughs> like that kind of yeah. it's, we're closed <laughs> so <I have> to <laughs> leave. <laughs> yeah talking to drunk talking to drunk people is an easy easy thing for me yeah i'm calling the cops <laughs> <laughs> so are you paddling now or are we done are we, are we done kayaking i mean what's your oh gosh T tomorrow i have to brew the pumpkin ale in the morning and then jump in the truck and drive to cherry creek for the cherry creek race you're racing so yeah, I got a race. Oh, I got my green boat out. Um, I haven't paddled it since the last Cherry Creek race. <laughs> so, yeah, it'll be good. It'll be good. What's your uh, what's your whitewater boat of choice right now? Oh, so besides my green boat? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I've got the Nirvana. I think we talked about this like two years ago. It's just uh, it's easy to paddle. Saves my ass. My, I think my first, because we had so little water out here, my first booth was on triple drop on the East Fort Kauia. So it's like, all right, you know, and there you go. The boat works fine. So piece of cake. Hmm. 
Did you get any high Sierra runs this year? No, nada. Zilp. Yeah, it was rough. So, I mean, yeah, Middle Kings quarter, didn't yeah. even run, did it? Uh, it might have run, but you would have been like, yeah, you had to be on it. Um, what did I? So I got the, uh, the people got into Upper Cherry. That was, uh, it had a window, but it was just early. So, yeah. I keep thinking next year, and then next thing you know, you're 48 years old, and like, I don't want to haul my boat up Bishop Pass. We can, you guys want to rent some mules with me? We can <laughs> do that. <laughs> Dude, Al G got some Sherpas, man. He got some like broke climbers around Bishop, paid him a hundred bucks, yeah. and they took his stuff all the way to the river. I, I can, yeah, I got several hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. <can> do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'll take all my NBC earnings, my, my six hundred dollars, whatever, and send that into climber Sherpas. <laughs> uh, well, I listened to a few of the highlights. I honestly struggled so hard to watch the Olympics this year. Like, yeah, it was like, it was hard to figure out which app and if you're a Comcast subscriber and like, so I would tune in to kind of some of like the, you know, the network stuff and obviously there's, it's on the other side of the world. So it was like time delay is like, I just I hope they figure that out. They need like, they just need to put it on Netflix. Everybody's got a Netflix subscription. Dude. Just put it on Netflix. Yeah. I, I think they need to figure that out. Because now they have so many platforms. They had Peacock. They had a USA Network. They had regular NBC. And that's something that I think NBC needs to figure out. Because some people want to watch the Olympics, but some people want to watch kayaking or they want to watch skateboarding or whatever. And they got to figure out how to cater to those people. But, yeah. yeah, I mean, Kara was not able to watch pretty much any of it after yeah. like spending hours of screaming at the TV and the computer and everything else. Oh, I was right, right there with her. Yeah. Yeah, and then the live stream, like you said, the announcing was was a little bit shaky. I mean, not as shaky as the right announcing, but yeah, you, it's. Uh... <laughs> yeah, I guess like I like in my imagination, it was like they were like they create the live stream and then they just drag in whoever like to like do the announcing on the live stream. I mean, it was just guys who were like they're like the analysis was like now he's going through gate four, now five, now six. <laughs> <laughs> like, like I like almost verbatim. That was what it was, you know. Wow. Like, that's 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 tough, tough act to follow. <laughs> uh, what's going on at the at the brewing company? What's what what else is going on out there? Mr. Well, uh, yeah, so we got we did our Oktoberfest yesterday. Um, so after I came back from the gig, my my other brewer is off on vacation, so I went back, right back to brewing pumpkin ale tomorrow, and then it's we got August, um, man. Yeah. Yeah, you got to get all that shit out now. Now, so it hits the shelves, and because it takes three weeks for it to ferment and all that stuff. So, leave the brewing up to me, Lewis. Don't ask any questions about <laughs> that. I got that part figured out. You can right. give me advice on the uh, the announcing side of things. When are we gonna be able to buy Kern River Brewing Company beer in in the gorge? Ooh, I'm gonna be up there. Uh, hop selection in September. You guys around? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Probably. Pretty- Bring us some double church. Mm-hmm. Dude, that'd be sweet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going out east for golly season at some point. Yeah, you guys I don't really, go? about, really care about you, John. I was <laughs> yeah, <laughs> zero. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> let's do let's do some viewer mail. You have viewers? Well, you know, listener mail or whatever it is. Oh, okay. Grace, what do we got? Oh, sorry, you're queuing me up here. Hold on. Yeah. Um, man. So, do we want to get into this whitewater technology press release? Didn't we talk about this already? About the paddles? Did we talk about it? Do you want to acknowledge our, our voicemail that we've uh, uh, yeah. checked just regularly <laughs> as I check my voicemail? Yeah, big apologies to everybody who's left the... <laughs> 86 <laughs> voicemails for the hammer factor that we didn't get to because I didn't realize that you actually had to go into the voice account to see those voicemails. So we'll get those <laughs> caught up, but I do feel bad about Anybody that. who's left us a voicemail in the last five years. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But about, like... So about the white one, the, the, the paddle company though, I and mean, what's, uh, what's the, 
I mean, the deal is, is right now in the industry, it's a hard time. It's, it's very difficult to get a paddle, right? Yeah. And there's definitely a lot of excitement in that market. And we have these guys making paddles. We should get them on the show at some point to hear what they're up to, huh? We should. And the reason I went to that email is, and this has to do with September coming out west, they were super bummed that there's no Golly Fest. What do you guys think about that? I mean, I don't know. For these guys, they're super bummed because they're like, this is, the, you know, they went to the North Fork Championship. Um, they're going to come to the Green Race and they wanted to go to Golly. And they're like, we don't have a way to get our product in front of people. I mean, they were like super. I mean, why don't you just go to the Golly and put your super bummed stand about tent up in the parking lot of the foot in? You'd probably get <laughs> way more, you know, just the exact same relevant traffic as you would. At the official Golly Fest. I mean, there was definitely talk of that, but, you know, it's like, uh, you know, it won't be as much of a congregation. What's the name of the paddle company? Where are they based out of? Whitewater Technology, and they're out of Greenville, South Carolina. Just about an hour south of here. You know anything about them? Like, what's their deal? Um, They've got some carbon paddles. They're at a factory that has, they have some tooling and some... Some good options. I don't know. We'll see. I mean, the, pro the problem is, is if it's not a Werner, I suspect it's going to break, right? I mean, that's not not talking about these guys in particular. I'm just talking in general. Like Geltman puts his, his Gala Sport in the back of the truck, or I put Geltman's Gala Sport in the back of the truck, and he pulls it out. He's like, no, no, it's got to ride in the truck because you'll break it. And <laughs> that's the world you live in if you don't have a Werner, I guess, right? I mean, my skepticism is I don't want to use a paddle blade that wasn't designed by a slalom racer. That's pretty elitist. Mm. Yeah, that's a trend here at the Hammer Factory. <laughs> yeah. we've been living. <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that those guys are trying to get it get it going, and they've been at it for a while, and they're just trying to get in front of people, and it's kind of a struggle. Like, I think they should I send done. Lewis a paddle and have him try it out. I saw it. it uh, they gave one to Tad Dennis that he had it at NFC, and I laid hands on it, but I've completely forgotten any specifics of that interaction other than that I saw it. Way to go. Is it just so. me or are you guys suspicious <laughs> of new paddles? Like, I, I don't want to discredit these guys. These guys may have it totally dialed. I don't know. Like, Oh, I'm just suspicious to the point that I'm curious why we're even talking about this. Why? <laughs> you just don't think it's been, you, I mean, what's your, what's your thinking? <clears throat> I mean, I, I guess my reaction to any new guy who, kayak paddle company is it's gonna suck and they're gonna be gone in six months and there's a billy Hearn. <laughs> <laughs> no i mean it's like i don't know like it, it, it had like accents of those what were those like seven two paddles the ones that were like the diameter of like a ski pole yeah like it, it reminded me of that that that's not a good thing for me to be reminded of and, oh it reminded you of that Something about the blade shape. I don't know. Like the blade shape was like dubious. Hmm. But I don't know. Maybe it's good. I just I, I feel like you got to get a little further down the road before I'm gonna pay attention. I mean, if you if you talk to retailers right now, they can't get paddles. They just can't. And that problem's not going to be solved anytime soon, as far as I can tell. So it's a thing. It's an opportunity here for them. I mean, I don't know. I, it's, I've just paddled a Werner paddle for so many years, decades at this point, and it just always works exactly how it's supposed to, that it's just going to be trouble. That's, I guess that's where I'm at is like, like, I feel like my interest is like, what am I using to go kayaking? And John Weld, your interest is the industry side of it. And so, no, you know, I'm like just there, like, maybe there's there's I, something I, of interest on the industry side here, but like as far as I just like, been around this paddle, I want to use like the answer is no. Like you have been around to see <laughs> so many crappy paddles out there, right? And especially yeah. crappy paddles coming out of slalom world where they weigh nothing and they're they have all this great technology and they break. And like you know, I was we were paddling Great Falls there with Maddie Kimmel and she bopped her her goal sport off her head on the spout and broke it in half. You know what I mean? But I mean, if you use a slalom paddle for creaking, like that will undeniably happen. Yeah. Anyway. Anyway. All right. What's next? <laughs> How about this article that came across our desk? Um, paddle battles. Locals want return to free access at the Ottawa River. What's your guys' take on this? I We got to get somebody on to talk about this. I'm fascinated by this whole thing, and I certainly have a gut reaction hot take on this, but I'll 
Oh, get us. No, no, no. Come on, come on. Throw it out there, Lewis. Work. Give us your hot take. No, huh? dude. I, I mean, we should learn more. Give us up to speed on the controversy, right? <clears throat> so uh, what, what I read is it sounds like the Kowalski family proprietors of Wilderness Tours rafting on the Ottawa have bought up a ton of private land along the Ottawa to the point that they're, they control all the access to the river now. And they're charging people to access the river. And, you know, I would suspect that their take on this is that they're going to store these lands and you know, keep them protected. It's better for them to own it than, you know, some developer or something like that. But, I mean, to me, this is like, it's like you're capturing the value of the river. Like nobody is paying to walk 500 feet across your land. They're paying to get to the river. And so it's like you're blocking off a public good and like capturing that value for yourself and that it's like pretty fucked. And how much is it? But, I believe it's like 15 bucks a person. Yeah. So basically right. the, uh, it's the, the, the Kowalskis are saying this is part of protecting the area from development and with their efforts to protect the river, they're forced to charge $15 for anybody to access the river. Is that right? Is that wrong? That's, I mean, that's sounds right to me, but I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, that'd be pretty cool just to charge 15 bucks. I mean, that time somebody went to the river. <laughs> I mean, it's 10 bucks yeah. now to paddle the Lower Yacht on a, on a weekend, if, if depending on the size of your party. Right? Really? I mean, again, I mean, it's like, yeah, I, don't, I don't support that. Bus but it, fees and user fees. And... But there's a difference between like, you know, like some public process that went into creating that and it's like owned by a public entity and like there's some democratically responsive process at work there, allegedly at least. And again, I'm not saying that that's good or right, but like that's pretty different than one person being like, like taking it upon themselves to start charging access for the river and charging well, whatever they want. I don't know. In Canada, it's different, but in the U.S., I mean, there is this, I mean, I, I think there's some sentiment out there that no one's taking care of these public lands anymore, and we're gonna, someone's gonna start charging money because it's certainly not coming from taxpayers. And uh, I just think maybe you know, there's not an exact correlation, but I suppose we better get used to being to start paying for this kind of stuff, right? Through user fees and parking passes and everything else. But I mean, doesn't fifteen bucks a trip seem like a lot? I mean, that's like if you went kayaking. 60 80 days a year you're looking at thousands of dollars well, what if you get a season pass i'm not sure they offer that well maybe they should you know 100 bucks get a season pass i don't know we got to get somebody a local to talk about this because i mean this is a cbc article and i i mean honestly like if it, they're going to provide a good access point and it's not going to be developed and you're going to have like kind of a wild experience on the river, there's value in that, you know, it's worth spending money on it, but I'd be furious if I was a paddler there to be clear. And I was, I was really upset to find out that I had to pay $30 for three people to run the lower yacht when I was there last week or whatever, two weeks ago. I thought that was ridiculous. Now but, is that a parking pass? What is that for? Uh, it's so there's like a, um, you have to pay for the bus, the shuttle bus that takes you out. And then there is a, uh, a launch fee. And then I was talking to the park ranger about it, um, Amos Ludwig, and he was saying that basically what happened was is that the the the, the computer system, the computer software company or the software company that manages their reservation system park wide in the park, which does the camper reservations and the you know all the reservations to put on the river. Long story short, they're charging six dollars a transaction right now, um, and so that's getting passed. That's more or less getting passed on to the to the people using the river. That six dollar transaction fee, not its entirety, but a good a good chunk of it. And I'm, first of all, I'm thinking, who pays six dollars a transaction for anything? I mean, it's not like reservation software is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, top secret. You know. You know. Yeah. I mean, that's that seems like you get that service for almost next to nothing on the on the internet somewhere, but. Um, yeah. Get it. What do you think? So, I'm. Um, I, I will pay money to recreate as long as it's fair. Like you think about the ski pass, I won't do it because it's too freaking expensive to go skiing with my family. But if I could, like if I had to pay 80 bucks for a year pass to paddle here on the current, I would do it in a heartbeat because I'm putting money into the resource that I, I'm using. Um, you know, I, I think as kayakers, we're we're definitely we're dirt bags as far as 
wanting to spend money to go paddling, but you look at almost every other sport and people are shelling out a lot of money and, and enjoying themselves. So, you know, there's a balance, but I'm not opposed to it if it's, if it's managed properly. I'm kind of with you there. I mean, the, you got to read this article. I'll put it in the show notes, but you know, they've dubbed the land, the national whitewater park. So, so they've, I don't know. There's just too many degrees of separation for me to, we got to get some people on to talk about this. You know what they're talking about. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. That's, that's probably fair. Yeah, no, for sure. All right. All right. Let me find something else here in the listener mail. Um, paddling in Yellowstone. You guys want to jump into this one? Mm. Geltman? Yeah. I mean, we got to get, we got to get Aaron Prusand on to talk about this. I mean, the, Paddling has been closed in Yellowstone for, I don't know, since the 50s. My understanding is that the reason for that originally was to uh, control fishing, like to control overfishing. There are a lot of better ways to manage fishing than cutting off access for for paddling. Um, There have been some efforts to address this. There was some legislation maybe six or eight years ago that Aaron Prusian was super involved with. basically requiring the park service to at least study the issue and come up with some reasonable rationale for why they're doing this, um, which they, you know, they don't have. It's sort of just like, this is how it's always been. Um, I think there's some conservation groups in that neck of the woods that are pretty vehemently opposed to allowing paddling in Yellowstone, but it seems like it's very much based on the aesthetic preferences of hikers to not have their view shed cluttered by the occasional kayaker. I don't think there's any good public policy reason for this whatsoever. It's kind of infuriating that this is the way it is. Um, but AP has been super involved in it for ages and ages, and it would be sweet to get him on to, to chat about it. Yeah, I mean, what's there? What, what what's the river like that that they're that they're? Well, well, let me read. Let me read. Spencer well, I mean, John. there's a. I mean, there's a fair bit of. of like I don't know, easy whitewater or flat water paddling that's closed off. You know, that doesn't have access. Um, potentially there's some like pack rafting, but like the marquee thing is the Grand Canyon, the Black Canyon, the Yellowstone, which, you know, the Grand Canyon is very hard to poach, pretty much impossible because you can see it from the road. The Black Canyon, the Yellowstone, um, we all have friends who have run it and I've certainly heard about it. And uh, <laughs> it sounds like it would be, you know, one of the best whitewater runs in the lower 48 states, you know, like for sure. Um, and it, you know, has a long season and it, it should be open to battling. <clears throat> yeah. But hikers do not want to see kayakers brown clawing and well, the good news is probably like, I mean, the yeah, good news treats. is that like 98% yeah. of visitors to Yellowstone never go more than 200 feet from their car. So they, they probably won't be overly burdened. Well, Spencer Jonas sends us this email. It's kind of a long email, but it's pretty good. So I'm going to spend a minute here and read it and it also ties into our fees for kayaking up on the ottawa he says hey um i'm curious what your thoughts are kayaking in yellowstone national park i primarily live in southwest montana and yellowstone is sort of our backyard being able to paddle the black canyon canyon and grand canyon of the yellowstone would extend our season for hard white water by at least a month as those runs are usually at great flows when most of the other runs in the bear tooth are dropping out as I'm sure you know, there are lots of other runs in the park that have a high paddling potential. I stop and look at the slides on the Lewis River every time I drive by, and I've heard stories about some phenomenal waterfalls in the southwest corner of the park. While painting my gear black and going in at 3 a.m. with a getaway car would simultaneously fulfill my childhood fantasy of being part of a heist as well as running a great section of the river, I would rather paddle it legally during the day with a high five from the Park Service Rangers. I don't want to come off as the white guy that thinks they should be able to do whatever they want, wherever they want. I understand that some rivers hold importance for native communities and that they would rather we not paddle them and that some rivers have sensitive wildlife habitat habitat that could be negatively impacted by boaters such as McDonald Creek and Glacier National Park, which would surely be a roadside classic, uh, class five classic if it were legal to paddle during runoff. I also don't want to make it seem like kayaking is a more righteous way to enjoy the outdoor than picnicking, wildlife viewing, hiking, running, fishing, or horsebacking, skiing, and all the other manners that people enjoy wild spaces in Yellowstone. Feel free 
to throw me under the bus if I'm out of line. I've heard a third-hand story of a kayaker who was caught paddling and the case went all the way to the Supreme Court where it was dropped because the judge thought it was a waste of their time. My knowledge is that people caught on moving water in Yellowstone can be charged with multi-thousand dollar fines and a felony. I understand AW made a concerted effort a while back to open up access, but it didn't get anywhere. I've heard legends of kayakers getting chased down by helicopters and of a rescue in which a search and rescue personnel was injured. It seems like these events, along with the unfortunate instances of people falling in the river or accidentally tubing into rapids and perishing, are usually cited as reasons why craft aren't allowed in the river. It seems like the Park Service also doesn't want to deal with rescues and increased use in low-use areas of the park. I get that, but it seems like there are easy solutions to most of those problems, especially when you can run a horse pack fishing trip up to the banks of the river and run a motorboat on Yellowstone Lake. Restricted permits like one launch a day on the sailway could be an option. Or I know myself and many others would pay $500 for a boating pass to help fund the increased use, as well as to help get together a volunteer river search and rescue team. Anyway, that was an earful. Most of what I've heard is third hand and would be interested to hear y'all's thoughts. Spencer. I don't know. It's a... I mean, you can snowmobile in the backcountry of Yellowstone. You can do so much stuff. It's always been weird to me how this is such a frowned upon activity. Yeah, I mean, it's it just comes from history and like institutional inertia, and like this is why we've always, how he's always done it. And I mean, I think the way we, you know, generally speaking, like the way we think about like wildlife closures or closures in general for recreation access, like an outdoor alliance, like the way we think about it is like if you're going to close access for something, it needs to be based on sound science. Like here, I don't think there's any science at all. Like two, it needs to have some kind of public process around making that closure. There's no public process here at all. You know, three, like when you create a closure, it needs to be like closely tailored to the need. Like there needs to be, you know, like for example, climbers have uh, a lot of climbing areas have raptor closures. Like when a climbing area is closed because it's like raptor nesting season, but it's not like you can never climb there. It's like it's closed during these months and the climate community accepts that because it's, you know, based on science, there's some public process around it. And like the closure is closely limited to like the need. And like the last thing is that, you know, closers should be equitably distributed across user groups and like the black Canyon, the Yellowstone, you know, there's a hiking trail that parallels the river the whole way. And so, you know, if it's too sensitive to allow um, kayaking in there, then it's too sensitive to allow hiking in there. And it's like if you're going to restrict the number of people that can go through there, like restrict the number of people that can go through there, but apply that equitably across like hiking and kayaking. So, you know, generally speaking, like there's nothing here that is really uh, sound public policy. And, you know, I think someday, hopefully this will change, you know so weird like you can kayak in the smokies like uh where the kui is at um sequoia national park you can kayak in yosemite like all of these places it's- yeah or like i mean the grand canyon right it's like just having people have the opportunity to take a river through trip through the grand canyon like diminish the values of the national park like not at all it's like a you know great way for people to experience the national park we need to get somebody else who knows more about it because it just seems absurd to me, but I yeah, mean, we got easy on. Yeah, when you've got like snowmobiles in the backcountry, but you can't kayak. I mean, there's a disconnect, in my opinion. There. Um, I don't know. Good email, Spencer. Thank or good uh, message there, Spencer. Thanks for that one. Well, this one comes to you. Mm. Uh, this is from Robert Taylor. He says, uh, question for Weld, if I'm making a plug and intend to saw out a rim from another boat to use as a template, which one you like? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, short answer would be, uh, I think the Walker rim I have in the OG right now, or, or the, the Steez, that's, that's been proven to be a really good rim. Um, but theoretically, you know, I, I think the circumference, and this is around the outside of the cockpit rim, not under the rim, but around the outside edge should be 92, 93 inches of circumference. And you want to have, you know, theoretically, a circle is a better cockpit rim than a rectangle, right? 
because there's a circle you can have tension pulling it from all sides so the problem with the the chili rim on that Z boat I was paddling was that the back of the room is flat and the sides of the room are flat and it's too narrow um, for the length. And so you have these long straight edges on either sides of the, of the rim, they're just going to leak. So it's just going to let water in. Um, and so there's a ratio. If you if the, if the, if the, if the cockpit's going to be like 34 inches long, it needs to be around 20 inches wide. That gives you just enough curve all the way around. So it's sort of rounded all the way around the edge of the rim. Um, and then you don't want any big dips, you know, like on old waste port boats, there's big D bumps and stuff like that. Cause there's just bridge across there. But, uh, yeah, I mean, so, I mean, a good example would be is like, I pat, you know, like the, the, um, we're getting into just to, to cockpit rim, uh, inside baseball now, but so the Waka rim and the, and the, um, ripper rim are almost, I think they're about an inch apart in circumference, which is not much, but the, the ripper rim is like almost two inches longer, right? So not only is it harder to get a skirt over the front of that rim, um, you know, because it's just that last two inches, especially if you're like 5'10", it's really hard. It's really, really hard. Um, but also that extra length makes the sides of the rim that much straighter. Um, so it's a subtle difference, but a really, really important one. Um, and I've told Piranha this, and I told Hipgrave this, man, if you, you we're going to be forced to make a rim just to fit Piranha, a cockpit just to fit Piranha boats here, before too long if, if you guys don't rectify that because it's just really really hard to get a normal xl cockpit onto these things i used to play nice with this but i'm, I'm it's getting it's getting old because we get blamed for this you know what i mean <laughs> it's not the boat companies we're, we're the ones that hear that my skirt leaks the skirt leaks the skirt leaks it's not the skirt you know what i mean i mean i mean it is maybe partly the skirt but it's mostly the rim it's mostly the rim shape right um in this day and age there's just no excuse for this anymore mic drop <laughs> so what boat so what is your ideal cockpit uh i think like like i said the steez the steez i'm paddling with is really nicely shaped and i don't want to keep blowing smoke up waka's ass so another one would be the original original uh all-star the first generation all-star was a really really good rim it was like 92 inches circumference is just the right the right and ej to his credit or whoever's you know dave knight was running his boats for them they paid really close attention to that that math as well. They they made a huge variety of rims, which are problematic, but the ones, but the general shapes were good, were sound. So there you go. You should rip off that Walker rim, and then you can just make the the molded in thigh hooks right yeah. at the same time. That's the way to go. I mean, honestly, there's there's no there's no reason to make a rim bigger than 92 or 93 inches. I don't care who you are, right? And if you're making a bow for someone who's weighs 260 pounds the boat's bigger it's higher off the bottom of the boat so they can get their knees out of that part of the boat the same way you can out of an 88 inch boat that's smaller um just because you have more room to pull your knees up inside the cockpit so you know for for you could really get away with two cockpit size two two cockpit sizes 88 inches for the smaller boats you know and 92 inches for the bigger boats that's it that's all we need you don't need to go you don't need any other size in between those bigger or smaller that's it period there you go yeah <clears throat> uh, we got a couple time for a couple more here let's go uh this comes from mark uh rigel he said dudes merced whitewater apostles want to know can we get dave facility on the line to answer some burning questions what is the design purpose of the scorch x is it mm. just a big large or is it meant to be better than a large so if i normally sit a medium should i get a large or maybe an X. Or maybe they're thinking I should own a smaller one for smaller stuff and a larger one for bigger rivers? Question mark. Or is the X filling its own niche? Is it the new outburst? Eskimo Diablo? <laughs> Congratulations, Piranha. You made an even worse drain plug. Zet kicked your ass on that one again. Love my ripper. Mark Regal, Mariposa, California. <clears throat> so I'm going tomorrow to actually pick up a Scorch X to paddle. So I'll be able to give some insight on that. But I have nothing else to offer. Do you guys have anything? I haven't paddled. Everyone who paddles one around here loves it. God, it's got to be. That's, I'm just so stoked they broke through that nine-foot imaginary weird barrier that boats had to be that length. I just went for it. Take it with a grain of salt. I think it's a totally different boat than the large. I think it's like a class of its own. And Gins, let me say something to you real quick. Well, geez. <laughs> let me explain something to you. 
uh, you're getting you're getting up there in in your years, right? Um, yes, we are. Yeah. And you know, I, I'm here to help you. There there has been some tremendous improvements made in whitewater boats in the past couple of years, like things that are really really different. You should try some of these new boats for sure, like the OG or the Scorch. I mean, it, it, I, I haven't spent as much time on the Scorch, but the OG is a complete game changer. So I, I tend to paddle boats until I break them, and I just don't break boats. Like, You're very uh, old school about that. I know. I understand. Yeah, yeah. But I, I'm with you. I, uh, I'd, I'd like to try the Waka and, and some other boats. Um, are you interested in paddling class five for the next 10 years? Is that part of the program? Or are you going to kind of wind things down here? <laughs> if, if we get whitewater in California again, I'm, yeah, I'm stoked. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Galvin, my... what do you think? Help me out here. Yeah. Get with the times, man. <laughs> what do you, what do you paddle, Lewis? Mm, mostly that puffy steez and the OG you where you are scared. Um, they make them with the stern kind of puffed up now. Okay. So it's like you can't really like spin pivot turns endlessly, but you can kind of like use the stern like in the same way you would like edge to the outside, like doing offsets or something. And it works really good. You can like load it up and mm -hmm. do these like long carrying booths. It's, uh, it's sick. It's a great, great boat. Ten years like, ago, I did I did not give a shit about white plastic boats. They're more or less all the same. Right. Yeah. Just get something that, yeah, like a Nomad. And just yeah. It does not matter. Plug it off. Does not matter, yeah. but I'm telling you, there's there's something going on that you should you should get hip to. All right, we'll do it, <laughs> guys. Come on down south. Show me the show me the ropes. Man, Cherry Creek race sounds fun. Let me <clears> sweet. That is. Your, are you still ready to? Are you gonna go mix it up with those guys or what? Yeah, of course. Who's who's, who's so, the competition? You've won uh, it, I know. No, nobody really shows up of importance, including myself. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you think about it. It's a 40 minute race, right? On class five. It's not like two minutes. It's, it's a battle. So I, I, I don't know. I, I find it a lot different than any of the other like class five races where you just got a lot of time with yourself and we do, we typically do a, a staggered start. So you're just paddling class five by yourself for 40 minutes. So it's cool. a fun. great, great run. Yeah. Fun run. Big features out there. That's always a fun run. All right, one last uh, listener mail here. This comes from Charlie, and this is directed at you, Weld. He says, hi, John. How are you? Had to send a note that I so appreciate hearing your voice on the podcast. Mm. You guys got me, us all, through COVID with humor, compassion, and a perfect amount of snark and grace. I was running up the mountain today laughing my head off at your 90s roleplay kayak dad with a VO2 max of an unborn fetus. <laughs> Freaking brilliant. <laughs> As a long-term whitewater and surf ski paddler, that segment was a gem. Nelson gave me your contact, and I thought you and the Hammer crew might be interested in interviewing Kevin Padden, Kirk Baker, John Paris, pioneers from the 70s and 80s for the audience in Expedition, Big Water Western Boating, and Freestyle, respectively. Cheers, Charlie. So, we got a couple yeah. of messages to hey, go Charlie. on that one. So. <clears throat> yeah, that's an, yeah, we got that a bit ago. Um, I don't know what you guys know about these dudes. I know nothing. Do you know anything? I mean, I know the names, kind of. Well, I don't know anything. I mean, there's so many people like that have pioneered little pockets of the country and different runs and whatever. I love digging into that stuff. Um, all right, dudes. We're not going into three hours here. We're going to get to our favorite part of the show. This is where we go into a rants or rave, something that your hosts are all fired up about or frustrated like trying to figure out how to watch the Olympics. So, who would like to lead us off here with a rant or a rave? Come on, Geltman. I know you're prepared for this. Yeah, always. <laughs> I, I'll rant right off the bat. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I, I soft-pitched uh, Mr. Weld a body fluid swapping story, and he never oh. brought it up. But it's the only it's the only money thing I had. What do you got? A Canadian body fluid swapping story. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, Rants and Raves. What happened here? I lobbed him this story about yeah. this Canadian woman who failed a drug test due to swapping body fluids and he just he glossed right over it. So moving on. Next, well, go ahead. Next. What do you got? Wait, 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 wait. Yeah, don't So what happened? 
was this like part of the breaking beds or something? So, uh, all right, I'll, now now that we built it up, it's not going to be quite as entertaining. But a, a Canadian woman in, in Sprint failed a drug test back in 2019 and was banned um, from the success of World Championships and Olympics and ended up getting reinstated because the drug was not taken orally um, or any other means. It was actually came from the body fluids of her boyfriend uh, at the time who was taking the drug and so she was able to overturn her ban saying it was a third party contamination of of, uh, of said drug so she was able to actually get into the olympics last minute like two weeks before the olympics and won a silver and a bronze medal in the olympics so hmm. Did you tell that story during the broadcast? <laughs> <laughs> we didn't mention the bodily fluid part. What's, it, mention, what's your co-announcer's name? Uh, that one was Brendan Burke, yeah. yeah. What a story, Brendan. This, <laughs> this young lady, <laughs> she was contaminated by bodily fluids. <laughs> yeah. so they weren't specific on the bodily fluids, but it was either, they said either semen, saliva, or sweat. So, um, with the three S's, you just gotta watch out for the three S's when you're taking your drug. <laughs> we actually, we actually wrote you some scripts to read, Eric, in your in your announcer voice. But did you send them over? No. Uh, oh God, the second one was brilliant. Yeah. Which one was that? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I don't know. You should send them over, and we should close down with one of those scripts while we do these you rants and rants. Do your rant. I'll see if, yeah, send him over. <clears throat> All right, see if I can find him here. Um, I, I, got a, I got a quick rave. I got a quick rave. I'm going to rave about, uh, I went and did a shoot for NRS um, for this program they're doing with the organization called Outdoor Afro. And essentially, they are teaching safe practices for black people to get on the water and go paddling. And just the general enthusiasm, uh, you know, we're so deep in the weeds and paddling. We, we just, just going out there and shooting these people and seeing them just steer the boat and float the boat and turning and flipping over and just, oh man, they were having so much fun. I'm just going to rave about introducing new people into the sport that totally is just completely foreign to them. And they had a blast and I hope that they continue to do that because it was just badass watching them have so much fun. So I'm going to rave about that. Nice. Um, I'm going to rant, man, I up here in Whistler and, uh, there's a massive development going in on the side of the Chequemus, like, like towards the end of the run, like just this like massive excavation and like, looks like a huge apartment tower going up up there and like, you know, just building up to like, I don't know, 30 feet from the edge of the river, it seemed like, and just like tragic, man. Like I had no idea that was going on up here, but just the, the level of development is, uh, it's a little heartbreaking. It was, uh, it was pretty painful to see that. Um, and I, you know, every, every time I go to one of these other sort of mountain towns, it's like, you just kind of see the future of, of the gorge and everywhere else that we care about. And, uh, yeah, it's a bomber, man. Man is a destructive animal. That's my rant. Get off my lawn. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Leave the trees alone. <laughs> Dude, that place has changed. So, 2001 was the first time I ever went up there kayaking. It has changed so much since then. It's hard to totally. even comprehend. That was before the Olympics were up there and the road. I mean, it's just like, it's just insane. I want to rave about Jared Slyler. <laughs> That's a good rave. We put it with him the other day. That guy's so fucking funny. <laughs> <laughs> He's just so fucking funny. He has, <laughs> we were just put into the Blackwater, and it's like a kind of a tourist attraction. There's like people in wheelchairs getting out. It's like wheelchair accessible, used to the falls. And this is just how it kicked the day off. He pulls up in this gigantic pickup truck, and he has like a PA system on it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, so you could hear it echo through the entire mountain valley. You know what I mean? People are jumping out of their skins. <laughs> and he has like a like an air horn that he blasts. This is the beginning of the day. But oh, he's just, I know. I don't know. 
I made my choice, man. God, <laughs> his brother's funny too, but that's that's it. I had. Oh, man. Man. <laughs> we could do a full show on Jared Siler stories. I'm just telling yeah. you, I have some oh, really man. good ones. <laughs> we did. I, I can't. I, I gotta think about how much of this story I can relay, but I will never forget listening to. Jared spit this freestyle rap in the persona of uh, Dylan Thompson. He's like a Kiwi kayaker. <laughs> it's like Jared rapping in his like <laughs> Kiwi accent, like as Dylan. I oh my god! I just I could I could do it no justice, but it made me laugh forever and ever and ever. <laughs> Dude, I can't tell you guys about going through the raw footage of editing with Jared and Evan, the original Dim Shits movie. And there's, <laughs> there's this one. I think we may have put a little piece of it in the credits. I wanted to put a lot more of it. They were like, we can't put that on the movie. But it was like four of those dudes, and they couldn't find a place to take a dump. So they all climbed up in trees and were just like pooping on the limbs <laughs> of these trees. <laughs> just <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was that's just one little piece anyway that, that's a that's a good rave well if you can if you could ever get a chance to do a road trip with, with with jared or graham for that matter i'd highly recommend it <laughs> me, me too all right <clears throat> are you going to shut us down here mr giddens you so what any, any, any paragraph really long huh <laughs> This is really long. No, I'll just pick a paragraph. A paragraph. Any one of them. We did a radio announcer voice where you, and doing like a radio talk up. Yeah. Or then you can do the, then we have a slot. That's somewhere in there too. I think you guys could all read one. <laughs> or not. <laughs> it's, right. so, it's so stupid. <laughs> I think it's really funny. But... All right, Ken. In the starting gate is U.S. <laughs> Lewis Geltman. At 40, he doesn't fit your typical profile of a slalom athlete. <laughs> But he's managed to balance a career as a left-wing podcast agitator and salmon. You said salmon. I assume slalom. Yeah. Uh, slalom athlete in his hometown of White Salmon, Washington. And working with his coach, Ryan Bond, he's developed a non-traditional training regime that has allowed him to remain competitive in a stacked field of U.S. slalom athletes for almost 25 years. I talked with Lewis before today's race about what keeps him motivated, and he credits his life partner, Darby, who... He says he helped him open jars and list things over his head, but also kind of just to keep him awake past 9.30 on most nights. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Wells. That's pretty Thanks. good. <laughs> Thanks, yeah. The next three paragraphs, it just gets better, but we'll leave it at that. No, I, yeah. <laughs> nowhere, near as, nowhere near as funny as I thought it, would, it might be. Uh, do you have a sincere rant or a rave that you'd like to lay on us? Um, hey, me? Shut us down here, Eric. Um, you know, I, I don't want to blow too much smoke up your guys' ass, but I, I am going to rave that you guys are still doing this and putting it together. Um, I mean, I'm not going to lie. I don't listen very much or ever, but, <laughs> uh, no, it's, it, it's, it's awesome that you guys are providing this, uh, these little pearls of wisdom for the, the packing world. And, uh, I certainly appreciate it. And I bet you're, uh, your many, many multitude of fans do too. So thank you for your service. And, uh, and John Weld, thank you for your cynicism. We all need mm -hmm. more of that. And, uh, and Lewis, for your, your beacon of, of truth that you are seeking. <laughs> and, and Mr. Grace for keeping this whole shit show together. So you guys, you guys are legends. That's my, uh, that's my rave. Well, thank you, Eric. <laughs> Hammer Factor 84 out. <laughs>